tonight on the Northwestern News Report, studying sustainability, how Northwestern researchers are responding to the changing climate. Medieval minus the Knights, what the Block Museum's newest exhibit reveals about Africa's role in the Middle Ages. Plus, cultural celebration, a look inside Northwestern's biggest event for the Lunar New Year. Those stories and more tonight on the Northwestern News Report. It's your news right now. Good evening and welcome to the Northwestern News Report. I'm Alexa McHale. And I'm Joey Safchik. Thanks for joining us. Tonight's rock cam shows a new paint job courtesy of Willard Residential College, as well as patchy piles of snow from this weekend. With this winter's wonky weather, climate change is on everyone's minds. NNN's Megan Leibowitz is here. She has the latest on Northwestern's findings. Megan? That's right. Between news about the Green New Deal, which was unveiled in Congress earlier this month, and that polar vortex still on people's minds, I wanted to talk to Northwestern researchers to learn more about how climate change is impacting all of us. Climate change talk is heating up. 2018 was the fourth hottest year on record. As temperature changes intensify, so has Northwestern's focus on climate change research. We're constantly emitting carbon into the atmosphere, uh, and the consequences of that uh, grow year after year. Many Northwestern researchers who are studying climate change and sustainability agree that this is of paramount importance, especially right now. I think climate change is one of the most pressing issues that uh, society faces right now. Uh, and there's uh, lots of, there should be lots of motivation. There's certainly lots of evidence to, to suggest that we need to reduce the amount of carbon that we emit as a society. Michael Wazalewski, the director of Northwestern's Institute for Sustainability and Energy, also known as ISIN, is worried about climate change creating a positive feedback loop. Once we get this going, there's no stopping it. And, you know, you could get enormous temperature increases, which are going to be um, the end of things as we know it. I mean, you know, you'd be, and that's really not a, that's not a uh, bit of hyperbole either. NU is taking several measures to minimize its CO2 footprint, like increasing the number of solar panels on roofs and managing electric power and maintenance vehicles. But what can students do? Make, make your friends aware. In other words, spread the word. Because basically, I think uh, the biggest problem we face is not technological at this point. Uh, we, can, we can solve this problem. The biggest problem we face is political. Megan, what else can students do to combat climate change? Even small lifestyle adjustments can help. Daniel Horton said people can be aware of what they buy, what kind of fuel they put in the car, and even if they grab an extra plastic bag at the grocery store. But Horton said the most important thing students can do is educate themselves and vote. Thanks, Megan. When the polar vortex hit, humans were able to bundle up under layers of clothes, or better yet, just stay inside. But I wanted to know what happens to Chicagoland's wildlife when temperatures are dangerously low. When temperatures drop below zero, what exactly does it mean to be cold-blooded? Many of our species that we maintain because we are in a northern climate, they've adapted to this. During the polar vortex, Chicago experienced sub-zero temperatures for 52 hours straight. At the Brookfield Zoo, it wasn't the extreme temperature that bothered most well-adapted animals. The issue was the wind chill factor. You know, you're looking at a minus 45, almost a minus 50. Uh, at least that's what it feels like. And even the polar bears kind of go, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to find protection from the wind or I'm going to go back inside. And it's not just at local Chicago zoos where the animals are affected. Here on campus, people's pets, the squirrels in the trees, and the ducks in the frozen lake fill are also impacted. I walk on the campus no matter the weather. During the peak of the polar vortex, Lucy and Irish Terrier Oz stayed close to home. I assume if I'm freezing, he's got to be on some level, you know, just cold and uncomfortable. You've probably seen salt like this used to make sure we don't slip on the snow, but that salt can damage a puppy's paws. At the Evanston Animal Shelter, special precautions made sure all the furry friends were safe. They get frostbite, they can die. I mean, they can freeze to death um, just as easily as a, as a human can. So you just don't want them outside for an extended period of time. 
And back on campus, where parts of the lake are still frozen over, Ziegler says the fish are fine thanks to oxygen in the water, and the geese use their down to stay snug. Rabbits stay burrowed underground, and squirrels wrap their tails around their noses so they don't breathe in dangerously cold air. Even when classes are canceled for the humans, the animals tough it out in the cold. Vicki from the Evanston Animal Shelter says to always keep your eye out for stray animals, but that's especially important in below freezing temperatures. You can call 311 or 911 if you see a cat or dog out in the cold. According to Evanston Police, a 17-year-old student was sexually assaulted by a former security guard at Evanston Township High School. School staff reported the incident to police in January. They said the alleged assault happened in November. Police say the incident did not take place on school grounds or during school hours. Officials say 33-year-old Michael Haywood turned himself in last week and declined to be interviewed by police. Haywood no longer works for ETHS. The school has not returned our requests for comment. If you still haven't completed Northwestern's online sexual assault prevention course, you only have a few more hours left to meet the deadline. The requirement was new this quarter. All students who are not first years are expected to complete the course by tomorrow. Students who don't finish the training may not be allowed to register for spring classes. Evanston Police released their annual crime report yesterday. Overall, crime is down citywide. Cases were down by about 3% last year compared to the year before, with just under 2,000 crimes reported in 2018. The report found fewer reported thefts and arsons while there was a slight uptick in murders and sexual assaults. Incidents of police use of force were also down, about 30 incidents in total reported last year. The Illinois State Legislature is revising an old proposal to raise the tobacco purchasing age from 18 to 21. The bill was reintroduced in the General Assembly since the legislature and the governorship are now controlled by Democrats. A similar bill passed the General Assembly in 2017, but was vetoed by former Governor Bruce Rauner. Evanston passed an ordinance raising the cigarette buying age back in 2014 and has one of the highest tobacco taxes in the state. Could Morty be leaving Northwestern? A recent report from USCFootball.com named our school president, Morton Shapiro, as a possible candidate for the same position at University of Southern California. He was named Dean of USC's College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences in 1994. A Northwestern spo spokesperson said Shapiro has not been in contact with USC. On campus, construction season is almost underway. Starting next month, Northwestern will rebuild the water storage facility on Lincoln Ave. The project will replace the existing water utility with a more sustainable building. The project is scheduled to wrap up in November. Expect traffic congestion on North Campus over the coming months. An ASG initiative is encouraging students to pitch solutions to problems on campus. The second annual Improve NU Challenge is dubbed Northwestern's Shark Tank. Students have been working in teams to develop their ideas, which they'll get to present in front of administrators. Students are competing for a share of $10,000 to put their plans into action. Last year's winner was Resilient NU, a wellness program that hosts trainings and events on campus. Improving NU was all around such a really incredible process for Resilient NU. Personally, it required that our team sat down and articulated the impact that we wanted to make on campus and our future goals for the organization. The competition is open to everyone in the Northwestern community. The final start at 1 p.m. this Sunday at the Block Museum of Art. Also at the Block, a new exhibit is gaining international attention this month. NNN's Olivia Olander went to check it out. Olivia, what's the exhibit about? Thanks, Alexa. The exhibit, Caravans of Gold, Fragments of Time, tells the story of medieval Africa often glossed over in history books. The works on display in the Block Museum's Caravans of Gold represent a journey through time. The exhibition shows fragments of medieval African art, remnants of a story nearly lost. They're really the vast remainder of what's left of medieval Saharan Africa. Curators hope this exhibit, filled with rare pieces of African history, helps reshape our modern conception of the medieval world. When we think about medieval, we immediately start thinking about knights and castles and you know we have a very eurocentric view slave trade and the history that came after it kind of has eclipsed a wider global view and this exhibit is part of a growing trend among scholars to broaden their perspective there's more of a turn just in general um, throughout um, throughout 
academic disciplines to think of the world more globally now. It's one story in amongst a lot of alternate histories that need to be told. The exhibit leaves the Block Museum in July and will travel to a Canadian museum before it reaches its final destination, the Museum of Black History and Culture in Washington, D.C. It's also the perfect exhibition for Northwestern in some ways because while it originates here, it couldn't happen without the wide network of partnerships that made it come together. Piecing together a landmark narrative, one fragment at a time. This exhibit took eight years to curate. Museum workers told me it took a lot of time to win the trust of these African nations to share these precious works. You can check out the exhibit now through mid-July. The Block Museum is free to visit and open to the public. Thanks, Olivia. Coming up, expanding the options, why there may soon be more gender open housing on campus. Plus, leave the laptop, maybe not anymore, what new research says about computers in class. It's going to be a bit warmer this week, but does that mean any less snow? I'll let you know what to expect this week, coming up on your five day weather forecast. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. Western University, we are pioneering innovation and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline. At Northwestern University, the possibilities are endless. If you're looking for gender open housing on campus, ASG thinks you should have more options. ASG has passed legislation asking Northwestern to expand housing that accommodates students of various gender identities. Students seeking gender open housing can incur higher housing costs and especially few options on South Campus. Right now, gender open housing is only available as suites and singles in Plex, Lincoln and Kemper. The new legislation asks for whole floors to be gender open. Many students, like freshman Marley Thorne, support the measure. If Northwestern wants to maintain an environment of diversity and inclusion, they should extend that inclusion to all aspects of campus, which includes housing. If ASG's requests are met, more gender open housing could be available as soon as next school year. Continuing our series on Black History Month, this week we celebrate the birthdays of two seminal figures in black history. Huey P. Newton, born February 17, 1942, co-founded the Black Panther Party in 1966. The party took root in Oakland, California, but spread to cities across the country including Chicago. Dressed in black berets and black leather jackets, they fought for fair policing and equal employment, among other priorities. Yesterday was Toni Morrison's birthday. The Pulitzer Prize winning author is best known for her 1988 novel, Beloved, the story of a woman's escape from slavery. Morrison has also won a Nobel Peace Prize in literature and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama in 2012. 
The Oscars are coming this Sunday on ABC. The Academy Awards shrouded in drama this year. Since the Academy announced there won't be a host, celebrities and commentators alike have proposed their own ideas for who should run the show. Who do Northwestern students wish was doing the opening monologue on Sunday? We ask you in this week's Rock Talk. I'm Andy, we are here at The Rock, and today we're talking Oscar buzz ahead of this Sunday's Academy Awards. Rock Talk. So who do you think should host this year's Oscars? All right, I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever watched the Oscars and couldn't hit, tell you a single person that's hosted it in the past. Uh, Morgan Freeman would do a great job. Why do you think Morgan Freeman would do a good job? His silky smooth voice, of course. I think I would pick Beyonce. She obviously wins, I think, at every aspect of life, whether she's just, you know, having a casual day, singing, dancing, and performing. She's probably one of my idols. Jeez, that's a hard question. Uh, well, I like Jimmy Kimmel, but has he done it a couple of times? There are two uh, sports journalists that I like a lot, PFT Commenter and Barstool Big Cat, who I think would make a pretty funny opening, but probably not their place. <laughs> it's Michael B. Jordan, guys. I'm going to say Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus? Why do you think Miley Cyrus should? Uh, because she's made a comeback in recent years, and I'd uh, love to see her on the stage. Do you think it would be a real party in the USA? I do think it would be a okay. real party in the awesome. USA. It would be nice if John Mulaney were to host it. Why do you think John Mulaney would be a good host? Um, I think he has a wit and like an offensive charisma that's really charming, and he's very popular right now, so I think it would be a good fit. And do you think there are any films that you wish would have gotten nominated or any that were snubbed? Uh, Paddington 2, big time. Also, Paddington 2? Have you seen the original Paddington? I haven't. I'm, no? I'm like, Just the sequel? I'm sorry, yeah. But why do you think Paddington 2 should have been nominated? Uh, because it's an incredible, f I'm not even going to call it a movie, it's an incredible film, work of art. I personally don't really know the whole lineup because I feel really bad not even into it this year. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm sure they'll do like, a good job. I really like the Into the Spider-Verse for best uh, animated film. So do you think Into the Spider-Verse is going to beat The Incredibles 2? I think it, I think it should. You know, Pixar, Pixar and uh, Disney always win. I think, uh, I think Into the Spider-Verse would be really good. If you have a future Rock Talk topic, tweet at us at NNN underscore news. Now let's head over to Rupa Paula in the studio for a look at your five-day weather forecast. Thanks, Alexa. This week's temperatures will be staying in the 20s and 30s, but by the end of the week, expect a slight warm-up. Tomorrow will be a bit warmer than today. Get ready for a mix of rain and snow with a high of 37 and a low of 25. Thursday will be partly cloudy with a high of 33 and a low of 21. By Friday, the sky will clear up for some much-needed sunlight with a high of 35 and a low of 30. This weekend, it'll get a little warmer. Saturday will potentially hit a high of 38 with a low of 34. On Sunday, you'll have to bring out those umbrellas again for a mix of rain and snow with a high of 37 and a low of 24. It shouldn't be too cold this week, so enjoy the slightly warmer weather while it lasts. I'm Rupa Paula, and this has been your five-day weather forecast. Back to you on the desk. Coming up, party for the pig. We'll take you inside Celebrasia at Con Auditorium. And the cost of campaigns, I'll tell you how much mayoral candidates are spending to prepare for the election ahead in Money Minute. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline. At Northwestern University, the possibilities are endless.
The Lunar New Year began a few weeks ago, but students on campus are still celebrating the Year of the Pig. The Chinese Student Association CSA and Taiwanese American Students Club Task hosted their annual celebration in Khan Auditorium over the weekend. <laughs> Celebrasia performances embraced Eastern and Western traditions. Along with student dancers, the event featured comedian and actor Ronnie Chang and America's Best Dance Crew Season 8 finalist, The Kin Jiz. Nearly 800 students were there to welcome the Year of the Pig. Students say they loved the chance to share new cultures. It's like pretty cool to see dances of like a different culture as well. Um, and I'm really excited, yeah. I think everything turned out really well. Everything's running really smoothly and I'm just so proud of everyone seeing TASC, CSA, all the performers, all the student performers coming together and just being so supportive of each other. People born in the Year of the Pig are believed to be diligent, compassionate and generous. Themes represented throughout the show. Joey, it's been a busy week in Chicago. That's right. We have Charlie Road in the studio with your Chicago News Update. I'm Charlie Road, and these are your Chicago news highlights. Another mass shooting took place on Friday. This shooting was in a warehouse in Aurora, Illinois. The gunman killed five people after being fired from his job. He also died in a shootout with police. This shooting came only one day after the anniversary of the Parkland shooting, in which a gunman killed 17 people. Sources within the Chicago Police Department told CNN that they believe Empire actor Jesse Smollett paid two people to orchestrate his attack. According to a statement from Smollett's attorneys, Smollett denies these accusations. And T-1 week until the Chicago mayoral election. According to a recent poll conducted by Telemundo Chicago and NBC Channel 5, there is no clear frontrunner, and 19% of people polled are undecided. Early voting has already begun. This has been your Chicago Update. I'm Charlie Road. For a closer look at the Chicago mayoral race, let's head over to Justin Sweetwood with this week's Money Minute. Thanks, Joey. As the election heats up, let's take a look at who's paying for these campaigns. In 2018, J.B. Pritzker and Bruce Rauner raced north of a quarter billion dollars in the Illinois gubernatorial race, setting an American record. Breaking it down, each vote cost the candidates about $50. But as the calendar turned to 2019, not much changed in the state of Illinois. The Chicago mayoral field includes a millionaire candidate and over $25 million in various campaign war chests. Let's take an in-depth look at the race for mayor in this week's Money Minute. Former White House Chief of Staff and J.P. Morgan Chairman Bill Daley, who is a multimillionaire himself, has raised over $7 million for his campaign, including a $1 million donation from Ken Griffin, who is Illinois' richest man. Cook County President Tony Preckwinkle is in second on the fundraising leaderboard, having amassed over $4 million. Daly and Preckwinkle are at the top of the polls with Susanna Mendoza, who fired shots at Daly last week, calling him, quote, Bruce Rauner's mayor. Rauner received a $36 million donation, also from Griffin, last year. But Mendoza hasn't exactly built her campaign on small donations. Just 0.2% of the money she raised has come from people giving less than $150. Lori Lightfoot, who is fourth in the polls, has raised 8% of her funds from small donors. With a week until Election Day, uncertainty is still in the air in what is expected to be a very close race. But if there's one thing for sure, it's this. you got to have the payers if you want to be mayor. For Money Minute, I'm Justin Sweetwood. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. Western University, we are pioneering innovation and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline.
Western University, the possibilities are endless. A new study shows that students who write don't necessarily perform better in classes than students who type their notes. Many Northwestern professors have banned laptops in their classrooms over past research, which has linked better performance to less laptop use. The new study found people who handwrite notes scored higher on factual questions, while laptop note takers scored higher on conceptual questions. Researchers say more studies should be done to confirm these new findings. It's midterm season on campus, which means you, like us, might be feeling a little more stressed than usual this week. This quarter, Wildcats Advancing Total Campus Health, or WATCH, introduced a new training called the quote, Eight Dimensions of Wellness to Promote Healthy Living. The eight dimensions include physical, emotional, social, and intellectual wellness, among others. The group encourages students to seek help if you're feeling overwhelmed by school or other stressors. To cope with stress, groups on campus are hosting study breaks and relaxing events. Resilient NU is having a guided meditation in Fisk with free cookies on Thursday at 5.30. And NU Recreation is offering discounts on massages until March 15th. If you want to talk to a professional, you can call CAPS at the number on your screen, 847-491-2151. Coming up, why this furry friend had a real treat of a week. We'll show you the dog winning over hearts worldwide after the Westminster Dog Show. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. Western University, we are pioneering innovation and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline. At Northwestern University, the possibilities are endless. This good boy has had a tail-waggingly good few days. King, a two-year-old fox terrier, won best in show at the 2019 Westminster Dog Show last week. To win, dogs must represent the best looks and behavior of their respective breeds. The Westminster Dog Show is widely considered to be one of the most prestigious dog competitions in the world. You could say life has not been too rough for the king of the show. <laughs> Joey, would you go to one of these dog shows? You know, I've never been. I think I'd be more likely to go to a dog pageant than a human pageant, but you'd have to keep me from taking them home. <laughs> Definitely me too. <laughs> and that's all the time we have for tonight. I'm Joey Safchik. And I'm Alexa McHale. From all of us here at NNN, thank you for watching and good night. <laughs> <laughs>